Judy, this is the OGM weekly check-in call for Thursday, March 16th, 2023. And how was the last set of storms on the West Coast treated y'all? They were south of where I am, so we're in really good shape. But boy, even with that, uh, the, the level of panic is high. And the level yeah. of snowpack is high, apparently. Yes. Uh, and the, the flooding was pretty significant, wasn't it? There were places where, yeah, it was flooded and uh, washouts and stuff like that. A fascinating thing for us is that National Oceanographic does hourly measurements of the river height at the Guerneville Bridge and then has a page with a computer projection of where it's going. Uh, and it's been over the years I've been here very accurate. So you look at the graph and say, oh, it's only going up to there, we're fine. And you stop worrying about it. But 10 years ago, you couldn't do that. So every rising storm could become a big flood. It's a tremendous difference. Really interesting. Uh, Stacey, the old... is not treating you well. <laughs> we had road closures here in Palm Springs yesterday because the the snow melt is so uh, drastic, you know, that uh, it's flooding the, <laughs> the streets here. And, and, and Palm Springs has a pretty, pretty good um, uh, water evacuation system, canals and everything. So it's, it's, I mean, that, that is going to be a big thing for California as soon as, uh, as the water turns now. I mean, the weather turns to have this massive snow melt. The water cycle but, itself is crazy. Go ahead, Judy. I was just going to say that in Minnesota, um, this is currently the fifth or sixth snowiest winter ever. Um, and if we had had, we also had some unusually warm days in winter season. If the rainfall from that winter season were converted to snow, it would be the snowiest winter ever. So it's like, you know, 110 inches total but it would have been 140 kind of thing. Wow. And that's a lot of snow. And I've been here 30 years and the, the 22 inch, 21 to 22 inch one storm that we got was the most I've ever seen in one dump. And it was a real um, immobilizing thing, even though they were on top of it, we're good with plowing. You know, they plow twice or three times if they need to, but they don't do driveways two or three times. <laughs> And so when I looked out at my driveway and there was 21 inches of snow up to within a short distance of the garage door, it usually gets to, to close to the door, but doesn't actually pile up on the door. That was daunting. And then even when they plow it, with the, they had to come in with different plows. They usually do push plows that just sort of drop and back up and then push it to the side on the driveway. This year, for that storm, they came in with bucket plows, which meant they couldn't get close to the garage door because they didn't want to push snow toward the garage door. So they only plowed till about four feet, five feet from the garage door, which meant I was left with 21 inches and a five foot swath <laughs> to, if I wanted to get out before they came back with their man and a snowblower, I had to plow that. And I don't like being, feeling trapped in the house. I had prescriptions to get. So I, I shovel, you know, a four by five patch of snow, <laughs> four by eight probably for the width of the car. Um, and it took a little while, but it was doable. But yeah. that was impressive. And then the snow drifts have been across the street from my driveway where there's a, a green grass cul-de-sac pad. The snow was eight feet high and mm. everywhere else it's four to six. And between my house and my neighbors, it's eight. Wow. You, you, said, you said you got 110 inches, I think. What's the normal, what's the normal level in a normal winter? Oh, 60 to 80. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Good luck. <laughs> so I, I, unfortunately, I think it's a, a likely to be recurring pattern, given the amount of moisture that gets up into the air now and moves over and gets cold and falls down. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's got me thinking that maybe someplace central U.S., in like Kansas City, where my daughter was or something, would be a more appropriate place to continue living. <laughs> 
Pacific Northwest is very nice. California. <laughs> it's hard That's to market I don't California live in New England days. anymore. After 33 years in England, I'm like, I'm done shoveling snow. <laughs> no, I, I mean, there are lots of interesting places to go, but I already have a place that I own in Kansas City that I was spending about half my time there when Blair was there as a postdoc. So it, that's pretty convenient to uh, to use. And if I were going to move, I think I'd, I want to wait and see where she ends up because I want to end up probably as I go into my truly elder years closer to the kid. <laughs> so she's in yes. Houston now, which would not be my first choice, both state and city. And so we'll see where she goes after her postdoc. Thanks, Judy. Um, it's what, we, go ahead, Carol, Klaus. That's why we're snowboarding. Get the best of both worlds. Yeah. Get out of the, the snow and bend. We just made, made it out in time. Yep. Cool. Um, we have a check-in this week, and the protocol we've been leaning toward, uh, I will describe, is the S, <clears throat> the abbreviated S uh, OGM check-in protocol. And it goes as follows. Please use the uh, Zoom hand raise to step into the conversation. And uh, the hand raises will be the same for all of us in gallery view. So you can tell kind of where you are in the queue. Use that to step in whenever you feel like it. Uh, during the check-ins uh, before speaking, take a pause. Uh, the silence helps us all process. Uh, if you want, unmute so that, so that we all know that you're not pausing because you missed the instructions on the pause, uh, but uh, but that you're just being silent for a little bit, and the silence has been really healthy and lovely for us. Then uh, I will not pass the mic, so don't expect me to, uh, to say, you know, so-and-so's next and keep going. Uh, keep your hand up while you talk and lower it after, please. That way you don't zip around in the, in the gallery view and we all have to go hunt and find you. Uh, and then uh, after check-in, uh, we will just participate together in sort of normal protocol. But during the check-in phase, please go only once. Uh, don't uh, don't don't jump in and start making the check-in conversational. We are just looking for um, answers to questions that matter to us. And then uh, feel free to use the chat throughout the call. Uh, the chat is just a variable we have. We can turn it on and off. If this were more like quicker meeting, I would ask that we not chat at all during check-in, but it, that, I'm feeling, unless you all feel differently, that the chat is uh, okay and it lets us take notes and sort of uh, release what we're thinking and, and so forth, and uh, uh, I'm, I'll be fine with that as well. And then um, I'm also not going to do a strong focusing question, but rather just what is happening for you in an OGME kind of way uh, by way of check-in. Uh, so I will now go into some silence and uh, Judy you're uh, first in the queue so you bring us out and then I'll I'll come back when we're done checking in Well, I jumped in just because there is clearly something that I'm working on right now where often my efforts are more diffuse. And that is trying to create a document that talks about after you bring people into a group with onboarding, how do you engage them? And then how do you enable them to participate fully in the group? And the engagement part is more straightforward in terms of the types of uh, get to know each other, understand each other's strengths and zones of expertise, those kinds of things. It's sort of how do you get acquainted to become the beginning of a working group. But then when you talk about the enablement and what we would do in the group dynamics to enable full participation and creative output of content and working plans that are ongoing from an execution standpoint. I think that's going to be much more interesting to try to develop a framework that will work on that. And I'm working on this with Wendy McLean, who's doing some work with other groups. So she's really doing the onboarding part. 
and has that well underway. And I'm putting together this, I don't know, treatise, possible biz plan for how we would engage and then enable the participation of the different groups. And I'm finding it fascinating actually to try to do. So I would welcome any thoughts or inputs from other people as well. Mark is next. Thank you, Judith. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for you to put your hand down. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thanks. <laughs> Good morning. This is uh, more of a personal than OGME check-in. Um, I tried to take four weeks off and try to get uh, um, temporary leave from February 3rd to March 3rd. Um, that was almost impossible. So um, I finally got a um, temporary disability lasting from February 3rd to April 3rd. So 12 weeks. I went through a lot of pain and found that the healing resources not only of UCSF but all over the place are just overwhelmed it's like a six-month waiting list for um a certain kind of CBT help and that's just wrong um I'm asking for help I'm in deep financial stress because of not wanting to work but just not being able to, just because of the life events, people dying, um, people dying with cancer. And as a cancer survivor, yeah, it's been hard. I need $300 to last me until the California disability kicks in. I would like 500 bucks and I'd really wish for a thousand bucks if people on this call can you know, help with a hundred bucks each, three of you, um, I'll pay you back. I'm good for it. That's my check-in. Thank you. Well, that's hard to follow. Um, What's on my mind are two things. Uh, the first is that uh, thinking about how people think about climate change, I've come to the metaphor of the right brain, left brain. So one half of our brain thinks that climate change is a big deal and it's a disaster and it's going to have personal consequences. The other half of our brain looks at daily life and its little tasks and what how to continue that with no reference to climate change at all. Uh, so it's not denial, it's, a, it's a more of a schizophrenic process. Um, because of living in Northern California, quite rurally the way I do, I'm not very affected by climate change issues and the local people are not very much either. So I'm feeling kind of out of touch. So in response, I've decided to move in late April uh, to Montenegro, which takes me kind of in the country on the east side of the Adriatic. Uh, it's a very complicated place in terms of the war in Ukraine, in terms of climate change, in terms of technology. It's a very dynamic place. So I'm looking forward to that end of talk.
what what is materializing in in my world uh, of uh, relating um, agriculture and and the food system to climate change and looking at this as such a existential crisis that we're moving into this year you know, this year is going to be uh, already the, probably the first of an incredible challenge to keep uh, to keep food on the table for for you know, a lot of people around the world um, the the need for systems thinking and systems tools is finally penetrating and uh, I had a first meeting yesterday with the group um, in central california um, a few farmers and different participants of the supply chain um, where we where we are starting to to help people think in terms of of a systems approach to en engage in their community so that means so that the challenge if i just put the challenge into a, a nutshell here is that we have reached consensus with the farming community by and large that they need to change what they're calling because uh, the primary you know, design imperative here is to restore soil back to health, you know, to put carbon and microorganisms back into the soil and, and uh, restart you know, the cycle of life inside the soil. But in order to do that, and I'm actually working with uh, a company that uh, de develops specialized seeds, um, and they're developing an artificial intelligence program to match seeds with uh, with uh, bio regions. So they have satellite data that shows microclimates you now to, down to like, like a very small grid. Um, and if they match that with data from the types of soil that a farmer has uh, and overlay that with the particular uh, climate data, they can make recommendations on here's a seed that is good for you in this region. You know, it can deal with arid climates, with wet climates, with uh, different types of temperatures and so on. So that's all in place. You know, the intelligence is there now um, to, to do that. What's not in place is this farmer now wanting to change into a different type of crop. So using a specialized seed uh, to find then a market to sell this into. So now you need to connect this farmer with an aggregator, with uh, logistics, with a processor, and then with market, with, with uh, market access uh, in order to complete this entire cycle. And the there is clear indications that the industry is not interested in uh, when you talk about fast food and, and processed food industries, which is not about 90% of our dollar sales. Um, there is no interest in, in engaging with that at scale. There are experiments here and there, but it'll take 20 years to, to unfold that into any kind of volume. So the system has to be rebuilt from the ground on up. That means you have to have hyper reach, hyper local and regional projects evolve. So Gene Berenger is uh, uh, is developing Kumu as a discussion tool. Um, so they have just released a new version of their software, where um, you you can carry multiple conversations similar to what we do, but instead of using Slack, you know the conversation is kept inside of Kumu. But my experience is particularly you know, in this meeting yesterday, when you're dealing with, with farmers who um, are so engaged in their, in their work, they may have, you know, these are not huge farmers, but what we call agriculture of the middle, they have a few hundred acres. So they are significantly in size, but they, you can't get uh, practitioners like this to sit on the computer and look at the Kumu map and find out how uh, they need to insert uh, uh, you know, their their opinions and so on. So there is a huge need to change uh, to to make this kind of information technology that we have been using here at OGM uh, and that Gene has been working on for a lifetime to make that accessible to people who are like basically um, technology illiterate, you know, and uh, and to to help them think in terms of of systems so, so to see the systemic uh, 
collections you know, that we are stitching together here, and we're calling it the coalition of the willing in a community. Um, and so the, the, the thought process is really easy. You, know, you, you get, because they're smart people, so they get right into this, but then to make these tools useful so they can uh, become independent, you know, you can you can send them off and, and let them perpetuate this. That will take some 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 work. So that's going to be my focus this year is to um, is to develop um, is is to assist you know, uh, in the educational process to help people use edu use information tools that are very commonplace in big companies uh, where where um, uh, that's you, know, you can you have the privilege of training and, and access uh, to specialists and so on. But in the small business community, medium-sized business community, these tools are still not penetrated. And to make that accessible, that's a big uh, deal. And this will help us hugely to, to, to rebuild this, this quant up uh, food business there. So when we get a little further, uh, Gina is, is big into it. I mean, he lost all this uh, tools and tools development, and um, yeah, maybe we can we can uh, pick up on this, and 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 maybe we can uh, see what what can be done to simplify and make those uh, make that technology accessible. Um, I've got a bunch of things I'd love to check in on, and I don't check in that often on these calls, so I made notes for myself in the chat, which will be cryptic until I unpack them right now. Um, I'm just increasingly aware of all the layered persistent threats that are outside and the messiness of the world, and I want the Ukraine crisis to wrap up quickly, and it's not, and all the and that's just one of, of many different layers of things going on but um yesterday i had a catch-up conversation with kyle shannon who was an old friend from new york city uh, in 1995 he and a bunch of uh, early early webmasters in new york started getting together and they formed a World Wide web artist consortium or WAC, um, which is where i met a whole bunch of really cool people in new york and it was really fun because they had uh, filthy lucre was not their motive. They were just trying to figure out how to make this web thing do cool stuff, even though they were building, they were starting to build commercial sites and all that. And it was just this frothy, lovely conversation that attracted uh, creative and clever people. And Kyle is having a moment like that now around generative AI. And it started for him with stable diffusion and the image generation, uh, but it's sort of cutting into other areas now. And he's hosting a new uh, generative AI salon. I I think it's on Mondays or Tuesdays. I'm forgetting when the standing call is. I don't have it exactly on my calendar properly, but I'll we'll find a, a link and uh, put it in here because I recommend if you want to catch up on what's happening with all this stuff, it's a really good place to go and to see some demos of people doing good stuff with it. Um, and then the conversation kind of exploded my wet brain with the conversation with Kyle, just the one-on-one -on -one yesterday, because I uh, started thinking about a, a bunch of different things, uh, including... I had had a conversation just before Kyle with Ida Josefina, who is the founder of Sane, co-founder of Sane, which is kind of a platform for making sense of stuff and simply showing little palettes of, of things to one another uh, for what you've seen around different topics, kind of a sense-making platform. And her goal is very similar to, to my goal and I think some of our goals here in OGM. And she and I had, had sort of rued the fact that there are all these platform choices out there, whether it's Gordon Brander's Noosphere Protocol or Rich Burden's DXOS, or I could name a few others, or a different layer, CoMakery uh, versus Disco.coop versus Social Co-op versus a few other layers. And I can easily say it's way beyond my pay grade to make those comparisons. And boy, it's going to take a lot of time to sort out what's what. And suddenly talking to Kyle, I was like, yeah, but we could feed a lot of this stuff into like GPT uh, and ask it for these sorts of things and make leaps through some of the things that seem really impenetrable and hard to do. Um, Pete, thanks for putting the, the link to the AI salons in the chat. 
Um, and suddenly I started thinking that a lot of the things I see as barriers might be dissolved if, if I and, and others who are on similar sorts of missions got pretty good at using uh, chat GPT and GPT-4 and all those kinds of engines. And suddenly I started thinking about how to better extend myself. Uh, and that took us down a particular set of avenues. But then also um, there's a one of the one of the many threads that's coming out of the chat GPT invasion into our spheres is, hey, why bother taking notes? We don't need to make sense of the world as humans because we have AIs now and we can just ask the AI for the sense making. And that grates me, as you might expect, extremely wrong. But it takes me into a place of trying to figure out pragmatically and practically what is a fruitful and useful combination of good note taking. And I have a particular quirky version of that in my brain and other people use other tools, but how might we combine our own note taking and note sharing out into the big fungus, as I call it, um, in very fruitful ways that then get amplified by all this generative AI uh, that's hitting our world. And um, so, so that, uh, so, so we had a, a bunch of sort of ideas around that that got me real excited about maybe changing um, just the way I see the limitations and possibilities around me, the way we're interacting, uh, the kinds of things that we generate. Uh, Kyle and another friend, Monique Elwell, created a, a company called Storyvine. I think it was Kyle's creation way back uh, more than a decade ago, I think now which lets you create kind of useful B-roll videos for companies. And he's looking back at his company going, I don't know, a lot of what I thought was cool about it, it seems obsolete now in, in light of this, but there's a couple assets that are unique and look what you can do to his company, his startup with all this new technology. And, and that riff was really interesting. And so I think there's a, I think there's a tremendous amount there. Um, and I'm trying to think hard and would love sort of help on the path of what does it mean to extend myself bigly a lot. Uh, and I'm also uh, trying to fashion up an offer for public speaking because despite being an old white guy, I think I have a lot to say and I think I'm pretty good on stage or in a virtual meeting and I would love to get more speeches. Um, so I'm I was calling it uh, my life as a cyborg because I've got 25 years of externalizing my brain, which makes me some flavor of cyborg. I don't have any artificial extended body parts, but there's lots of flavor of cyborg. And then I had a conversation with a guy who said, you know, that's kind of a boring title. How about something more like Confessions of a Cyborg? And I was like, yeah, that thing. Um, so I'm wondering what the Confessions of a Cyborg are. And I, as I, every time I shower, I come up with a slightly bigger conception of what that might be or feel like or taste like. And that's, that's exciting to me. Um, so, so... And then, and then occasionally, as happened at the end of the conversation with Kyle, I end up um, feeling like my brain is being pulled too hard and in sort of these different directions. I feel like uh, Spider-Man in the metaverse, uh, where I've suddenly fallen through the cracks. I feel like everything everywhere all at once, where I, I might be landing in the wrong metaverse right now. And wow, I better sort of be careful in navigating how this works. Because I need to, I need to maintain my drishti, which is uh, if you're doing a yoga practice, a drishti is a point that you sort of defocus on that helps you balance in in difficult poses like one-legged poses. And and uh, April and I are using drishti metaphorically for how to find some stability in turbulent times. And I, as I started, I think we're in pretty turbulent times. Um, so I'm trying to navigate that boundary as well, because one of the questions I asked Pete when, in one of our early conversations in the chat GPT excitement was, Pete, uh, uh, aren't you feeling like you're losing your boundaries? Uh, like, where do, where do we end and where does this thing start? And we, when we start ingesting materials created by this thing and taking those as, as fact and all that, how does that work? And just interesting things there. So with apologies for a relatively lengthy check-in, but all of that stuff is swirling in my head and I wanted to share it out and see who else is who else is interested. Morning all and, and thanks. Um, thank you, Jerry. Um, I, I rather like check-ins that are, uh, non sequiturs. Um, 
I, I'm not a fan of conversational check-ins or, or check-ins that create a conversation um, if we're doing pure check-in. Um, however, uh, um, I happen to have an interesting experience with ChatGPT yesterday, um, and I wish my check-in was not about ChatGPT. I wish it were about something interesting like tide pools or, or grass or something. But anyway, um, I learned something interesting. Yesterday I was playing with a 87,000 word um, corpus text conversation uh, from a bunch of people. Um, and, and I'll probably share it. Um, uh, I'll, I'll share what I was working on uh, you know, sometime later this week on uh, the OGM list. But anyway, um, uh, 87,000 words is a lot. Uh, there were you know, like a half dozen um, participants in this conversation, very rich, deep, interesting conversation. So um, as is my want, uh, I, I thought, huh, um, maybe I could get ChatGPT to summarize this. Um, and my first caveat is, you know, watch out when any, anybody actually, uh, AI or a human is summarizing something, uh, you're going to miss stuff. Um, so uh, the thing I learned, I, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, I'll, I'll save that for an email, but the, a, a really interesting thing I learned, uh, which surprised me and I didn't know it before, uh, is that I found that you wanna use ChatGPT as a verb and not as a noun. You wanna to, want to have a conversation with it about the corpus that you're looking at. You don't want to have a one and done kind of thing. So with a, a long conversation of 87,000 words, um, you can, it, it turns out I had to break it up a lot. I had to break that thing up into eight different pieces so that I could feed it into chat GPT and, and uh, otherwise it's too big. Um, but uh, in the process of kind of doing that, I, I fed it chunks of the, the text a, a couple times and it came back with a different summarization each time. Sometimes the summaries were shorter, sometimes they were longer, sometimes it zeroed in on some really interesting details, sometimes it didn't. Um, so not that, not that it's a human, um, but uh, it was also a little bit surprising that a bot doesn't have a, you know, a standard answer for a standard input. That's something that we're kind of used to. Bots just kind of, you know, are, are not, not very variable. So um, the variation and then my ability to kind of ask it for different things um, made me realize that it's, it's something I've, I've started doing with ChatGPT anyway working with it iteratively is a lot better than working with it one and done. So, you know, so that's my, my big lesson, my big takeaway by my big share. Um, uh, and, and it's a big shift uh, because we're used to, we're used to, you know, even the, so the weird thing is, and I felt guilty about this kind of because I was throwing a lot of text at it and I'm using their new model chat GPT or GPT-4 which is just out and um, they've got a limit on how much you can use it at once kind of and so I was trying not to use it very much but kind of inevitably I did and and um, uh, the it's it's a, it's a different experience. It, I, I guess, you know, in the olden days, I would, you know, have somebody summarize 10,000 words or whatever, and you would only do it once because it's kind of a pain. But when you do it over and over, and especially when it changes every time, and especially when you can ask it different questions, you know, now give me a shorter summary, now give me a longer summary, now zero in on the concepts rather than what people said. Now, you know, um, give me a really, really short, summary of it or who said what or or that kind of thing you can do that with chat gpt and it's very patient and you know it it's not on not on a timer and it doesn't get bored of you asking the same thing over and over and over that it really qualitatively changes how how you absorb the material um it's it's like you're it's kind of like you're in a 
in a workshop, um, you know, with a bunch of different perspectives on the thing. Um, you kind of have to drive the perspectives, but ChatGPT is very willing for you to do that, you know. Um, now make a limerick out of it. Um, were, did, was there anything funny in here? Uh, was there anything super serious? Was it sad? Was it, you know? So iterate with ChatGPT. Don't just use it as a task bot. Use it as a, a co-pilot or navigator uh, as you're exploring information. Thanks. I like the silence. I, I've been rediscovering the joys of jet lag and the silence dances very well with that. <laughs> Just sit and be quiet for a long time. Uh, but in the interest of flow, so I just traveled for the first time since COVID, um, which was uh, strange and actually okay. Um, uh, it was uh, kind of a working vacation, went to a board meeting and had some downtime um, and uh, feel pretty slammed having come back. Um, so there's that. I'm uh, on the board of a company that's deeply involved in energy storage. It seems my life is drifting a lot to energy transition these days uh, and fascinating stuff, some of which I can talk about another time, some of which not yet, but um, pretty exciting stuff. Um, and um, um, and just as a side note, uh, has started to shift my perspective on the role of hydrogen in the transition. Uh, have been very skeptical of now, uh, considerably less so. Um, so that for another time. Um, Ken and I hosted another Living Between Worlds call yesterday. This is third Wednesday of every month. Um, talking about uh, with with Bill Bowie. Uh, from r3.0 about networks and tipping points and um, uh, included uh, the work of Centola, which Ken has brought up before. I find myself not persuaded particularly by the math uh, of tipping point of the tipping point conversation, uh, but very fascinated about the, um, the the nature and significance of connectivity in networks, what those connectivity maps look like. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, I guess the one thing I'd summarize about that is that um, um, uh, Bill showed us maps that look like fireworks and maps that look like fishnets and maps that look like collections of fishnets loosely connected by a few connections or clusters of fishnets richly connected by multiple connections, which feels more like what we do here um, and more appealing to me. Uh, and you know, Ken may have more to say about that. Um, and um, last but certainly not least, uh, like Pete, I've been um, playing more with our friend ChatGPT. Uh, um, very much echo, Pete, what you're saying about iteration being key. Um, uh, kind of a conversational iteration. It, I, I find that it's that its first pass is like seventy percent, um, not just useful but accurate. I, you know, it, it, asking it questions about things that I know I find that it's just dead wrong on certain things, but it cleans up pretty good if you poke it and and guide it. Um, so I'm moving from fascination and kind of theoretical conversation about is this good, is this bad, you know, what's the what's the social dynamics and possible future da, 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 of all this to how to use it, recognizing that the game is on, you know, and whatever we say, this is this is going to be a big part of our future. Uh, so I'm looking at how to get to know it and how to use it to my advantage and not just let the big guys um, do stuff. And for for me. Um, uh, my first recognition is that it's a damn good research assistant. 
uh, really good at doing uh, complex scans fast, including uh, Jared, I think you mentioned this earlier, um, saying, you know, give me a, give me a table comparison of this area with here here's some rows and here's some columns and go at it. And then two or three iterations, and it's actually pretty damn good at that point uh, as a starting point. And what I'm starting to do and really focus on is using it as a writing ally uh, to both mine and repurpose my existing work and help me crank out the stuff that I want to do uh, in the next phase. So, um, Peter, I like your term of co-pilot. So for me, research assistant and co-pilot uh, might be a good way to play with that. Um, and that's what I got for now. I'll chime in just a little bit. Uh, apologize for joining late and leaving early, um, but uh, here in Washington, things have gone completely screwy and not just because of Silicon Valley Bank. Um, last week, we had three different hearings on Capitol Hill on the future of the internet, and they were just surreal. I mean, I, 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 I don't know if anybody else is watching these hearings, but it's so depressing to see the political establishment so far behind where the technology is. And the fact that chat GPT is now scaring everybody and that Twitter is being blamed for the, for the collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank makes the politicians even more fearful. So I'm seeing this not just in the United States, uh, there are a few countries where they seem to actually be digging down and talking to the people who understand the technology, but my life has been tech policy for 35 years, and it's just things are going off the rails. It, it's all about trying to hurt your enemies and help your friends. It's, it's, it's so sad to see this new economy being wrapped around the old games where companies use lobbyists to get regulations to give them advantage in the marketplace and hurt their competitors, rather than asking the question, what's good for all of us? And how do we share more knowledge with more people more effectively? And the latest thing is, of course, the biggest threat to chat GPT, which, which is the people who produce all this content that is being used as input are now saying, what's in it for me? And some artists, of course, are, are making the case in a pretty visual way, saying, hey, you know, chat GPT is making paintings that look just like mine. How fair is that? So there's a whole new fight over copyright that could uh, very much constrain chat GPT. Um, and then the other thing is that we're seeing a lot of rhetoric around China. And that was another hearing that we was held last week on how um, it's us or them. China is an existential threat. Um, I don't know if the politicians who use that phrase understand that when you say existential threat, it means we can exist or they can exist. We can't exist together. But that's um, a, a, another trend and it's a bipartisan trend. And I don't know how we walk back from that. The Chinese are actually trying to walk back. They're, they're doing a lot of grassroots person to person diplomacy, but at the high level, the rhetoric is still pretty disturbing. So it's, it's, it's been a very strange week, um, but thank you for letting us share. And it's always good to hear what everybody else is up to. Hello. Anyone who hasn't checked in yet, this is your memento. Jerry, if I can add one more thing, just to share a personal point. Um, 
my full my my halftime job for the last four months has been cleaning out my house, particularly a basement full of 30 years of artifacts. And it's been absolutely fascinating to dig through papers from my White House years and from my even before then when I was in the Senate in around 1990. And just to see these documents that were so full of optimism and, and many things predicting what our future could be with the internet and supercomputing, we've achieved a lot of it. And it's it's kind of it's kind of bittersweet though to see that we've also achieved a lot of other stuff that hasn't been all that helpful. But we need to celebrate what we have accomplished a lot more. And I, I've been posting photos of some of these documents because there was a, there was kind of a George Jetson kind of ethos at the time, right? It was there was going to be magic, and um, and we've we've. We've created a lot of magic, but we we just keep asking, oh, so what's next? We we don't celebrate the magic we've already created. And we don't celebrate some of the small case studies that may be happening over here that nobody knows about. So that that's that's my my plea to this community and to everyone else is let's let's celebrate the the progress we've made. Well, as my friend Bob Horn says, uh, I've never talked about this before, so I'm curious to see what I'm going to say. I never know what I'm going to say when I come up for a check in here, but I think I'll open with uh, gratitude to Pete. Um, for over a year now, he's put together the Plex every couple of weeks. And it's been so rich and so phenomenal. And I know it's a big amount of work and I don't know that he gets the accolades and recognition he deserves. So Pete, thank you so much. Um, you were a genuine community service guy, and uh, I really appreciate it. Mark, I want to thank you for having the courage to uh, ask for what you need. Um, I, I wish more of us did that. Um, and I'm sorry you're in tough straits, and I see a bunch of people have stepped forward to help, and um, I think you're going to make it with the help of the community. Which brings me to, uh, I don't know how many people here are familiar with uh, Peter and Trudy Johnson Lens, but they're in fairly dire straits. And there's a community coming together to support them that is really inspiring to see. Some of it's financial, a lot of it is, is you know, how do we um, work with the law in Oregon to take care of these people? And what does it look like to grow older? Um, they're both in their later 70s now and, and compromised by health. And like, what can we do to support each other? Because the, the social safety nets are, are failing us and um, we need to do some community around that. So. Um, I'm kind of on the periphery of that community. I've only participated in a couple of calls, but it's also very inspiring to see. So my, my thing lately is, um, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but I, I heard this story that, um, you know, in the, when they do the Tour de France, there's still these bridges with the, the timbers going lengthwise and there's spaces between them and people were driving their bikes and crashing and having problems. And uh, the, the sports psychologist said the key is to focus all the way down the bridge, look really far down the road. Do not look down where you are. You have to look forward and look down, down the road, not look down at the road, but look. When I took drivers, I said, aim high, and you gotta look where you wanna go. And I, I find that to be a really lovely metaphor for anytime I look down, I get really scared. I see all the holes. I see the fact that we've run off the cliff and we haven't quite fallen yet. It's like the coyote, you know? But if I look where I wanna go, then things seem a lot more um, doable and a lot more, a lot easier to handle. So for years, we've heard this quote from Einstein, you know, that you can't solve a problem with the level of thinking that created it, which is actually not an accurate quote. He was in a New York Times editorial, he was asking for $200,000 um, to begin an education program to change people's thinking, because he said, the unleashing of the atom has changed everything except our way of thinking. And, um, but he wasn't, clear on how do we shift what what does it look like to get out of the level of thinking that actually created a problem and there's another quote of his that says imagination is more important than knowledge and i think that's that's the way out um when we find ourselves stuck and asking how do we solve this how do we do this 
I think that's the wrong question at the wrong time. It's the right question for a different time, but it's the wrong question to start with. Um, Because if we want to get out of the level of thinking, we have to first step into imagination and say, well, what what would this look like? How could this situation work where um, everybody's taken care of? And uh, that can lead us into an imaginative realm where we can get some real ideas on how things are going to work. Then once we have a sense of that, we can start to ask now, how do we actually actualize that, operationalize that, make it practical? So I'm... uh, I don't think what might this look like is enough, Gil. I think that's really weak. I want to know how does what would this look like if every single life form was taken care of? Because that's what Earth did. Earth evolved this amazing, you know, fluorescence of life everywhere. And the, as the poet says, the children of all species were taken care of for all time, and humans have come along and fallen out of that, and we're we're creating the six mass extinctions. So what does it look like for the world to be, for humans to play a part in the world where we're healing it instead of destroying it? That to me is a, a question worth exploring. Um, and I don't have the facility for it, but I do my best. Uh, so anyway, just a bunch of rambling stuff. I'm reading an amazing book called Water Always Wins, which I can't recommend highly enough if you want to know about water. And and um, it just, it it touches everything. Uh, and if you are, water people have a saying, um, there's two kinds of levees, those that have failed and those that are gonna fail. Levying does not work. Gray infrastructure does not work. We've got to, uh, there's this thing called the slow water movement. How can we slow water down so that it percolates and, aer- and, and replenishes the soil and not run off of all the, the concrete that we put around the world? So. Really interesting book. If you want to check that out, it's pretty fun. Um, that's Paul Kraft. No, this is Erica Geis, I think. Um, and I think you went Paul Krafell rather than... Uh, anyway, uh, so that's just some stuff bubbling around in my brain. Uh, as always, it's a, it's a pleasure to be on these calls with you. I, I learned so much from people and I just, um, you know, to me, the pandemic's not over. I'm still masking when I go into public buildings with people, um, but I am getting out a little bit more. But but this community, along with a couple others online, has sustained me for three years through the pandemic and made me feel connected to people when I felt very disconnected. So I also want to offer some gratitude for that. Thank you. Do we know if David is by his machine? <laughs> Am I next? Am I yes. lost? The you crash? are. Thanks for asking, <laughs> Stacey. I was going to check in in a little moment, uh, same way, but uh, you're on deck. Uh, yeah, these are such great tra- check ins. I kind of, I, it's like, it's like, like deep and meaningful, and I'm, thinking, oh, I don't really have a deep, meaningful check-in, but I'm going to go with it. The uh, We've been uh, we've been traveling a lot over the last year. We left our apartment in Oakland in June and haven't been haven't had a fixed address since then, uh, and well, for a couple more months at least. And uh, it's been interesting to experience a couple of things. One is the number of things you need an address for, including like car registration and things like that, health, health insurance and stuff like that. So we've We've been testing Kaiser's uh, uh, remote health test, you know, services and things like that. Um, but uh, I've been a little bit struck by and thinking about Mike and the internet and the you know the miracles of the internet, how robust the travel infrastructure has been. We just really haven't had any problems. Like we can book flights on airlines around the world. We get our hotel rooms. We, you know, in, in Indonesia, we're using the Uber competitor over and over again. It's just works. Um, it's like kind of global infrastructure is pretty robust right now. Um, and a ton of it relies on the internet, right? So it's like how the hell that thing became stable is amazing to me. But um uh but it's it's kind of fascinating. And and being in a place like Indonesia, we were in Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, Cambodia, uh, with the exception maybe of Cambodia, those places seem really kind of upbeat. Like, you know, they they're excited. Indonesia is um We'd lived there back in the 90s, and it's just 
come, you know, kind of come into its own. It's a confident, you know, dynamic country uh, in a way that it, I didn't think it was, you know, 30 years ago. Um, so it may be some of this introspection that we're dealing with a little bit, you know, Eurocentric or American centric, and there's uh, some of the world that's not experiencing the same drama that that we are. So anyway, uh, you know, get rid of your house and travel more is one of my thoughts. So I just don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> and listening to a whole bunch of smart people um, check in about what they're uh, doing and what they're thinking about just drives the I don't know a little bit further. Um, um, I, I spent uh, two weeks in Hawaii, which was just lovely. We're not thinking about anything. Um, just uh, looking a lot of beautiful natural terrain um, and looking at the ocean. And it was just kind of lovely to do that for um, two weeks and not think very much about um, the kinds of challenges uh, that we seem to be facing. It's really interesting listening to Mike talk about um, what's going on in D.C. and the, <laughs> you know, the idiots that are running our country, um, for the most part, not all. Uh, listening to David talk about, you know, the importance of getting out, that there are other perspectives in um, different parts of the world. Um, um, I fear that Stuart's device is frozen because I don't think he's holding up that pose for this long. It's and a new I, asana. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Stacey, if you want to start, then we'll pick up with Stuart when he um, figures out that it's... Oh. Go okay. Ahead. Well, Mike's check-in really got me rattled in a few. It touched on a lot of what I'm thinking about and so even when he when he talks about you know the threat of you know TikTok and how it's being used, and I wonder how many people on this call, is as savvy as everybody is, actually knows what the threat like the pro the threat is. Forgetting about who is the person they're focusing on, what is the actual threat? Like how is that a danger? And those. What I'm trying to say is there's a lack of beginner information in general, and these are the people that are still weighing in with opinions and talking about things, and that ties into what I've been thinking about because I recently, I re it recently dawned on me that what Fox News and the right-wing media is, is really a babysitting service designed to keep people occupied and doing other things. And what I did the other day in one of these groups where there's the two political groups, you know, yelling back and forth, I took a new approach and I said, I'm going to do this the Tucker Carlson way, since I know there are a lot of fans here. And I started asking questions, questions like what happened the few days before the Silicon Valley bank run? Why, why is Fox not focused on Signature Bank? when Barney Frank's on the board and that would be an easy target. And now with this arrest of the billionaire, the Chinese billionaire who has ties to Bannon, heavy into crypto, was working on a media company and just declared bankruptcy. Like, <laughs> um, so I just threw out all those questions. I guess what I'm trying, yeah, I'm all over the place because 
in the beginning of the call, Klaus had mentioned how they're trying to think of ways to get people who aren't technological to use tools. I'm always focused on the media and what drives people that aren't deep thinkers to engage. And that tied in with what Judy was saying. But I just feel that there's no place for people that want to learn. And some of those people fall on the conspiracy side because we usually say they're dumb. But the thing is, when a lot of people that fall into conspiracies do have curiosity. They shouldn't be confused with the other half of their team that just is looking to like, you know, jump on and, you know, throw their emotions in a certain direction. So, yeah, so that's my ramble. I guess what I would like to see, because I consider myself a learner with a curious mind, there's so many smart people. I would love to be able to choose two people to sit in, to sit in, pick their brains together, because I would pick different people for different topics. And I think that affects how engagement happens. And yeah, again, I'm, it's hard to articulate what I mean, because I'm always looking at things from, you know, a higher perspective and looking at all the different, the different systems. So it's hard to pull all my thoughts together. But <laughs> That's the best I can do. <laughs> and I think everybody's checked in. Am I correct? Have we missed anybody? Cool. On, on this protocol, I don't track as carefully whether I got everybody. <clears throat> oh, good. Um, Who's Jenny? Jenny? Yeah, Jenny, thanks for joining the call. Um, we have just finished a check-in round. Okay. Uh, so happy to have you here. And uh, I was just going to follow up on something Stacy said, and then we can, if you'd like, you can sort of uh, say hi uh, and check in a little bit. Um, and Stacy, what I wanted to say was that um, I've, I've landed at the same sort of place, which is there's not a lot of um, material for people to just pick up and figure out what's going on. And I think my motivation was a little bit different, which was uh, there are a lot of simple things and inexpensive things that people can do to make their lives better. Uh, they just don't know that they exist. They, they don't, they, it's hard to invent new behaviors and they haven't heard the stories. So I started creating YouTube shorts, 60 second videos, just my talking head, no fancy graphics of any kind <clears throat> to try to say, Hey, look, there's a bunch of these things out here. And so the, the link I put in the chat, the shorts to revitalize cities, is a YouTube short that uh, it, that tries to basically, uh, I'll do a quick screen share for a sec, since we're in the discussion part of our conversation now. But um, so here's the, the page that I shared. Here are the shorts that I created. So here's a build an edible landscape, which is my 60 second explanation of this very nice 2012 TEDx talk by Pam Warhurst <clears throat> from the city of Todd Morden in Northern England talking about one way to re revitalize your city. And so I was trying to um, uh, motivate myself to make more of these. I haven't made nearly as many as I'd like because I'd like there to be a, a simple tapestry or big fungus of content <clears throat> uh, that is popular, that is not freighted uh, politically, that is just like, hey, if you're curious and you want to figure out what to do, troll through this list and... Um, and maybe you'll find something you and your neighbors would like to do. And so I think that I, I agree entirely that there's not nearly enough material like this out there. I don't know where it should live, which is kind of why I went toward YouTube Shorts, because uh, Instagram Reels and TikTok and those sorts of things seem to be the flow that a lot of people are paying attention to right now. So maybe if you drop little, little rafts into that flow, they'll float in front of people who could find them and benefit from them. I don't know. I think there's lots of interesting dynamics here, but um, I'm curious. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious about what what ways you think would work better, because I might lean that way. Yeah, I don't have an answer to that. The only thing I would say is back when David Gray had started the School of the Possible, in order to join, you had to like write up a lab. So I had to come up with a project because I didn't have one. 
And the idea that I had, it was for a fact checking lab where you had teams of people that had opposite political views. And it wasn't really so much about the fact checking itself, but it was about the relationship building between those people that were working on the team together. So again, I can only, I can't answer what you're asking. I could just tell you where I think a, a small starting point is. Thanks, Stacey. And I'm gonna also put a link to my one of my amateur theories of change, which is that uh, storytelling of the kind I just said, plus trusted relationships, plus a few resources can lead to lasting change. And it's one of the few change dynamics that, I, that I've seen actually work in places. Um, Mark. And then uh, after whatever, Mark, go ahead and step in and then we'll pause there. And Jenny, uh, if you'd like to check in, I'll, we'll, we'll go to you. But uh, Mark Carranza first and then Jenny. Just a little silence for a while. Um, been an AI researcher since the 80s. And I highly mistrust AI. I spent yesterday with um, the AI researcher Monica Anderson that I posted about um, in chat. Um, she's absolutely brilliant. She gave me a case for her AI uh, called a confidant, a personal AI that basically reads all of your self-written material and basically sees how it can help. The I'll try to make this as short as possible. The um, case study was a wounded veteran um, who uh, was alone and hurting. And the AI would um, look for and find somebody a couple blocks away who has extra time and extra resources and could help. And I said, that's a wonderful case study. Here's my problem with it. The problem is the same problem why a social worker or the Veterans Administration or, or um, you know, the person's care team, um, you know, I'd rather give them money than the billions spent on AI. The problem is the same. Number one, will the veteran who's in trouble ask for help? Number two, will that veteran listen? Number three, if help is offered, will that veteran accept it? That's the same problem with the social worker and the community care and with an AI. It's just way cheaper to pay people and give them the time to help each other rather than spend it on this ridiculous speeding up of our society where we text people instead of call and we have reflexive misunderstandings of these short tiny texts because everybody's too speeded up to listen thank you Thanks, Mark. Um, before going to Stuart, uh, Jenny, if you'd like to step in, and also we're we're sort of adopting as a practice, just take an arbitrarily long pause before jumping in if you'd like to. Just uh, we're appreciating silence between what everybody says a lot these days. I, I, Jerry, I just wanted to say that I did not finish my check-in. Oh, that's right. I was either I was either interrupted by the Alameda Power Company or God. Um, <laughs> just uh, just as I was about to get into something that I thought might be interesting. That's totally right. And I apologize for not remembering that. When last we saw you, you were like this <laughs> for a suspiciously long time. Um, well, <laughs> so I'm uh, Jenny, would you rather uh, go or have Stuart finish what he was uh, checking in oh, on? Or? Oh, let, let Stuart finish. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of jumping on a train as it rolls. So I, just let me jump, carry on, and if I have something I must say, I'll I'll let you know. That sounds great. Thank you. Stuart, the floor is yours. So, Mark, thank you for kind of teeing that up, because I, I, I couldn't agree with you more in terms of we are 
we are in a we are in a morass of our own uh, of our own making, and I'm just kind of feeling flooded with so many words, so many words, and and um, and so little time for um, for real connection, um, and and that's where the juice of of life um, really is. So I've been I've been reading in earnest this wonderful book, and I think I've mentioned it here before called Restoring the Kinship Worldview, Indigenous Voices Introduced 28 Precepts for Balancing Life on Earth um, by um, <clears throat> Four Arrows and uh, Darcia uh, Norvez. And it's really filled with the 28 um, chapters of incredible indigenous wisdom um, by people who are both deeply steeped in um, uh, preserving indigenous wisdom and people who have also accomplished a lot um, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the Western world in terms of you know, academic standing and doctorates and all kinds of um, credentials like that. Um, and more and more, I find myself retreating a little bit <clears throat> from all of the buzz and the morass um, that we're in. Um, and so the only other piece of the check-in is um, I, I've started to write my way through in earnest these 34 or five things that I've identified um, that we needed to address as a species. Um, and one of the consistent themes that keeps coming up is we need to just clean our hard drives. <laughs> We've created a system that just doesn't work. And, and the hard drive is just, is just there. And, um, you know, in, in, in some ways, um, let the reprogramming process begin. Um, but one of the things that, that comes out of the kinship world is that there had been, you know, uh, and nobody, nobody can actually know this for a fact, but three, four, something like that mass extinctions um, in the history of, 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 of the planet. And um, it seems that we're, we're, we're pushing <laughs> towards another one uh, because of the, in, in some ways, the electromagnetic energy that we're creating with a lot of the different kinds of insanity that uh, human beings are perpetuating on Earth. I saw a um, little piece in the media about the beginning to drill in Uganda for oil. That they are, you know, cutting down the the forest and and destroying the the, the elephant territory, and um, it just is heartbreaking um, what we're doing as human beings in the name of money and profit and progress. So that's my check. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stuart. Um, and Jenny, I'll leave it to you to jump in whenever you feel like. And mm -hmm. Mark, the floor is yours and be posy as you wish. Thank you. Um, thank you, Stuart. Thank you for thanking me. You're welcome. Stuart talked about cleaning our hard drives. I work at the Internet Archive. We have 100 petabytes of hard drives. The problem is not that we have so much information. It's how to get it to people, how, how to basically let people access it. It's <clears throat> called um, basically search. It's an incredibly difficult problem, and we're looking at AI to help. The stored wisdom of mankind is there. The ancient Greeks. First, do no harm. Two, know thyself. The Boy Scout motto, be prepared. And what I'm learning to ask for help, asking for help. Incredibly simple. Did I follow all of these? I precepts and things that have been known for not centuries but millennia no and so i hurt myself the 
but I did have that information, but I didn't listen inside until I got hurt really, really bad. Now, in AI, there's a number of philosophers, there's associated disciplines. One of those disciplines is philosophy of mind. And Jerry Fodor, in a personal conversation at UC Berkeley, after talking, after listening to his talk, basically said, you know, history repeats itself. First is cognitive science, then is AI. But the AI practitioners typically don't know cognitive science. They're looking for a quick profit. Good for them. They want to feed their families. They want to, you know, possibly do good in the world. Or Google's motto, don't be evil, is former model, a former um, motto. Um, now the motto is be as evil as we can get away with. Apple, you can do anything you want just so long as we basically, you know, have a control over our ecosystem so that we make as much profit as possible. Now, I don't have that much more to say, except the information is already there. The people who are good are already here. It's a problem of coordination. We're all willing to cooperate, but us, Jerry's kids, don't coordinate very well at all. And that's really difficult to do. And there's lots of bugs. I'm a professional software debugger. I can't solve it. I can only try to use a process, identify the problem, check the problem statement, by requirements, document, do the code, do the tests, and deploy. Thank you. We have a few minutes left in our usual 90 minutes, 90 minutes of call. Um, and I'm curious where we are and what we'd like to talk about in this last stretch. Uh, Doug, the floor is yours. Yeah, I think this image of being flooded with words is really important. To me, it's like we've been building a sandcastle which has a form, but then it starts to fall apart. As it starts to fall apart, what becomes visceral is all the grains of sand and the form is being lost. And that's what's happening to our words. It's very hard to find a place to land in the sea of words uh, where you can say anything that's really meaningful, that's likely to catch on. And it's funny because I'm... <clears throat> Um, you you triggered in my head the the web is dead the internet is dead there's a whole series of tropes about how you know this 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 thing has become despoiled by commercial presence or by chaff or by misinformation or by name your force and I find that my experience of the inner tubes and the web and all that is as fruitful probably more fruitful and joyful than ever that uh, there is a tremendous um, a flood a torrent of crap out there but that if you sort of like dust it off and like burnish the shiny the shiny bits um it's still vibrant and full of insights and aliveness and then i then i was thinking about how the shiny bits still float downstream and and i you know you can sort of spot them and pick them up and and pull them out and other people see other shiny bits and some of that is the the the, the maelstrom of misinformation that it has some of us worried sick. Um, but, but Doug, I think that that somehow things are still going viral, things are still, for good and bad, um, the system is still doing a lot of that stuff. It's not, it hasn't, it hasn't collapsed in on itself. It's just, uh, 
reshaping itself uh, constantly, um, which is and maybe part of what you mean by the sandcastle uh, being wiped out is that we build a little structure and then it get you know a wave comes in and, and takes out that the turret and that side of the castle or something like that. Um, but I'm I'm sort of struggling because I, I see both the deluge but also the virtue or the the benefit of uh, of the medium still happening. Um, Klaus then Stewart, and take your time. Yeah, I I would. I mean, as 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 scary and challenging uh, it all is when you when you look around at the exponential pace that the environment is uh, is uh, shifting and changing because of uh, what we have done, not just you know, in form of climate change in a sense of having released fossil fuels, but also the incredible destruction of the natural environment, uh, mostly through the food system. The, the awareness you know, through the information systems that we have in place um, is also uh, increasing exponentially. And I think we underestimate the impact of um, information that is going out there. Um, I mean, on LinkedIn, for example, um, the sustainability professional group has 350,000 members. You know, so I'm, I'm through various groups, there's a million people uh, that are participating in conversations related to um, basically the food system, you know, and uh, um, the, the energy system really uh, uh, focused on minutia now. Uh, we started talking about the farm bill three years ago um, I got the Sierra Club uh, uh, focused. We created the book club um, and got into the minutia of how this thing works. It's the biggest bill after the defense bill, and no one has ever heard of it, really. Um, we are deep, deep into details, you know, talking with members of Congress, having uh, by now a large number of people who are really uh, understanding you know, how this works and how these investments are being distributed and allocated and so on. And so there is, I mean, there is some reason for optimism and doubling down you know, on sharing information. Really, that's uh, the most important part um, is to, to just to just consolidate information in ways that um, makes people aware that this is a system, right? These systemic connections, if you push a button here, it has an impact on, on, on all these other points here. And so, um, yeah, I don't know if we, if we can swing fast enough. Uh, and, and the, the most, the most, um, the most challenging thing really is that in spite of understanding how dangerous this all is and 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 how um we are really teetering at um tipping points that we can't afford to pass and probably have passed several have passed already several um people are just so stuck with their with their own uh world they just don't want to let go right and the it's just like in the energy sector, when you think about uh, electrifying the automobile industry, think about all the car mechanics, you know, spent a lifetime working on combustion engines and all of a sudden uh, their entire um, skill set you know, is, is rapidly becoming you know, obsolete and extrapolate this to the entire industry, what this all means, how disruptive this is. You have that same disruption Know, impending on in in the way we handle food and this is you know, a multi-trillion dollar industry globally connected so the, the 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 sheer magnitude of change facing us is completely overwhelming but when you go down to the ground level you see people starting to listen up starting to get hopeful starting to see where they can engage so so i don't know where I'm going with this, but, uh, but I'm, I, I have seen 
a progression of of consciousness of conscious awareness you know, about uh, the environmental impact of our action and our connectedness to nature that is really very remarkable is it fast enough i don't know um i'm 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 trying to stay um i'm trying to stay optimistic but it's it's uh it's uh it's a challenge so two thoughts uh <clears throat> pardon me <clears throat> one in response to what doug said um I feel almost disincentivized to publish anything, to put words out, because the morass and the sea out there is just so huge that why bother? Everything is just going to get lost um, anyway. And then uh, class, I think that optimism or pessimism is not a really useful um, perspective right now because we don't know <laughs> we just don't know and so we do the work because it's the work to do um, a wonderful uh, quote from the talmud do not be daunted by the word by the enormity of the world's grief do justly now love mercy now walk humbly now you are not obligated to complete the work but neither are you free to abandon it. <laughs> so it's kind of, we have to do the work because it's what we're here to do. And, and that, that's as an individual, you know, everybody here is doing their best to make a contribution in some way. And, um, and, and, and that's all we can do right now. But the idea of optimism or pessimism or thinking that we're gonna, you know, have the solution. I don't think it's useful. I think it'll make you crazy. <laughs> Just my thought. <laughs> so I thought I'd share another poem, another William Stafford poem. Um, it's amazing to me how, how I choose these the night before and they somehow just seem apropos of the call. This is called Jeremiah at Minimagish. <clears throat> Somewhere up there, God has poised the big answer to the new doctrine written all over this country in concrete by the corporation everyone has bought into that leads to where the Minotaur waits. Waits just over there by the new mall or at the end of your carefully planned university course, your Moloch Award, your honors, your degree fastened like a dog tag around your neck for life. As the freeways are nodding around cities, getting ready to reach out, but scattered in little pieces, the old times trail off into the mountains and hide, forming their avalanche. Then, salvation. Somewhere up there, God has poised the big answer to the new doctrine written all over this country in concrete by the corporation everyone has bought into that leads to where the Minotaur waits. Waits just over there by the new mall or at the end of your carefully planned university course, your Moloch Award, your honors, your degree fastened like a dog tag around your neck for life, as freeways are nodding around cities, getting ready to reach out, but scattered in little pieces, the old times trail off into the mountains and hide, forming their avalanche, then salvation. Have a great week, y'all. Thank you, Ken. Beautiful poem. Can't go wrong, William Stafford. Stafford for the win. The way it is. <laughs> and that's the way it is on Thursday, March 16th, 2023.
And everybody who knows what I just echoed, raise your hand. And on his last night of saying that, when the mic went off, he said, except it isn't. <laughs> thank you, Walter. Um, thank you all. We're kind of at the end of, of uh, this week's call. Um, really appreciate your presence. I love the pauses and uh, have a lot of uh, tabs to go track down and harvest into my brain. Mark, we will send some resources and uh, you'd like to have a last word? Yeah, thanks for the poem. It was very great. Um, one of the things I loved about, um, and and forgive me, chemo brain, um, I don't remember the uh, um, collective intelligence thing that um, was done by people in France and um, was really good. Um, but after the check-in, after the, the formal thing, then they stopped recording and people had a party. People had social time. Um, and that was incredibly good. Um, so that's a process suggestion for these um thursday calls thanks everybody have a good time and uh please take care of yourselves and others yeah exactly thanks mark thanks everyone see you on the inner tubes <laughs>